Applied to international relations, the prisoner dilemma helps us understand how anarchy makes cooperation really difficult because of the absence of information, creating distrust and suspicion among states. So returning to that example I said before, where let's imagine you're Russia and I'm the America, and we both have an interest in disarming. And what we want to do is create a nuclear arms treaty where we both sign an agreement which will lead to both of us reducing nuclear weapons over the next 10 years. Let's say we both disarm, okay? So this is a, the prisoner's dilemma's matrix and each different type of um, decision has a different outcome based on what you decided, um, well, we'll say you're Russia, what you decided and what I decided. Now, if we both decide to disarm, we get, I get two, you get two. The higher the number, the better for our country. And this is pretty good, like two and two is pretty good. We both cooperate, uh, we both disarm, which means to give up our nuclear weapons. And if we both disarm, the nuclear arms race stops, both the USA and Russia start disarming, there's a reducing of nuclear weapons, thus increasing the security of both countries through various ways by lessening tensions between the two countries and less chance of spread of nuclear weapons elsewhere. So like, if we try and reduce our nuclear weapons, there's less of an incentive for other countries to, de to develop them for their own security. That's pretty good. But the danger for me is if I... Sorry, the danger for me is if I disarm, if I cooperate and you defect and defect means not cooperate, I'm in a really weak position because suddenly I've given up my nuclear weapons. I'm on minus five. You haven't. So you're on five. And suddenly the power imbalance is huge because I've unilaterally given up my arms. You've decided to keep the same or maybe increase your nuclear weapons. And suddenly, Russia now has much more power, particularly over, let's say, Eastern and Central Europe to dominate. So the danger for me is I want to cooperate with you, but ultimately I can't trust you because if, if I don't have information about the, your intentions, I could be in this situation. And what's likely to happen like, is that neither neither of us trust each other and we're going to end up with both of us defecting neither of us disarming so we'll both be in this situation where both states do not disarm the nuclear race continues thus the security for both countries is is vulnerable but just remember like this situation for you um so for sorry this situation for you is it's better than this situation where you actually disarm and I don't and then the USA is in a powerful position so what this shows us is like we don't want to be this guy like if I'm American I give up my nuclear weapons and you're Russia and you don't give up your nuclear weapons I'm suddenly in a much weaker position I've given the advantage to you okay so the prisoner's dilemma means that in the absence of information and certainty about the other side's intentions, it is really hard to cooperate. And in the short term, it is better to defect. So I'll just show you that again, because in the short term, my, like with the USA, if I cooperate and disarm, I've got two and minus five. If I don't disarm, I've got the outcome is either five or minus one these outcomes are better than these. So in the short term, it is better uh, to defect. But where countries have shared long-term interests in cooperating, they may create global rules to bring stability and transparency to the relationship. Like ultimately, if you decide to not disarm, and I do, well, I'm, never go I'm not gonna cooperate with you anymore. So the next iteration of this negotiation is always going to be we're both defecting because neither of us trust each other. 
So in the long term, to build trust, we want to create stability into the relationship. We want to make sure that we can cooperate over the long term. And basically what has to happen is we try and get to this place. In the long term, this is the best option for both countries. This reduces tensions between the two countries and we're not involved in this arms escalation where we're both harming each other's security. We just need to be able to trust each other to both disarm. So how do we do that? Global institutions facilitate this, okay? So neither of us are gonna trust each other, but what if we created a third party institution that didn't have any connection with either of us and it's neutral that can monitor whether both sides are complying with international rules. So let's say we create the International Atomic Energy Agency and they send inspectors to America, like America's nuclear facilities. They also are sent to inspect Russian nuclear facilities and they see whether either country is developing nuclear power for weapons purposes or whether they are doing it for just peaceful civilian purposes. Now, if you have this type of verification that like if I get information from the International Atomic Energy Agency that these guys went over to Russia, they inspected the nuclear facilities and they, they uh, determined that you were only using nuclear weapons because uh, for civilian and peaceful purposes, then that gives me confidence. This level of transparency where I can get access to information about what your country is doing, this helps build trust. Because suddenly then I can go, okay, well, I'm going to reduce my nuclear weapons as well. Because I have verification that you have done this. So this trust helps to ensure states act collectively to stop the proliferation and spread of nuclear weapons. And that's ultimately what countries want. They want more stability in the international system. But the problem is we can't trust each other. Now, if these uh, inspectors come to your country and they note down that actually you are developing nuclear weapons, then if the country is not complying, um, so they are developing nuclear weapons, the International Atomic Energy Agency can refer to the UN Security Council. And the UN Security Council is probably the most powerful international institution uh, in the world. Um, it's made up of five countries, Russia, uh, the United States, China, um, France, and the United Kingdom. So basically the winners of the Second World War. And the UN Security Council can then decide on the punishments. They could apply sanctions to a country which is not following the rules on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. The real weakness of the UN Security Council, and this is something that I really want you to remember, is that it is made up of political bodies. It is made up of those five powerful countries. So if, for instance, Syria starts developing nuclear weapons, then Russia, who is part of this UN Security Council, Russia is allied to Syria, and Russia might say, well, no, we're not going to impose any punishments. We're not going to impose um, financial sanctions. We're not going to invade the country. Uh, so if one of those countries vetoes uh, a resolution to punish a country for breaking international law, the UN Security Council won't do anything. So it is a legal body, but it's also very much a pol political body. So global institutions they bring transparency and trust to state relations in conditions of anarchy. And it helps countries to act collectively to solve some of these cross-border problems. And they also do a lot of other things that are related to what I've just spoke about. And I do want you to remember this slide. Um, I do want you to have a really good understanding of the type of things that global institutions can do. So they can regulate state behavior. So they enforce international law. Uh, they punish states which break international law, so the UN Security Council. Uh, what I will say about punishing states, this is not very often. Many international institutions don't really have very strong uh, 
uh, enforcement mechanisms and punishment mechanisms. But with the UN Security Council, this is a possibility. They could also mediate and settle disputes, like the World Trade Organization, for example. Uh, they provide financial assistance to countries struggling to comply with international norms. Uh, the World Bank does that. Um, they, dis they disseminate information, so they provide expertise on international issues. <coughs> with regard to the pandemic, the coronavirus, uh, the World Health Organization does this. With regard to climate change, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change provides information and scientific studies and data that it shows to governments on how to mitigate and stop climate change. It also creates norms, expectations and standards of behavior on how civilized countries should behave. So when the, Uni U the United Nations passes a resolution, this creates a norm of how states should behave. So let's say there's a resolution on human rights. This is the international community saying to other countries, if you want to be part of this international community, you have to follow international human rights law. You cannot just start torturing people. You cannot just start you know, killing people uh, without due process through the courts. Um, North Korea, for example, exists outside of this idea of civilized countries because it does not follow any of these norms or expectations and standards of behavior. It does not really listen to international law. France would very much follow these norms and expectations because it is proud, is, proud of its reputation as being a good member of the international community. One other thing I want you to note is some countries are more globally integrated than others. Uh, countries are to different degrees integrated and embedded in these networks of international governance. France, for example, has high engagements. So if we look at France, it's a member of all of these international organizations. It's really integrated into um, global governance, like across a set of loads of issues. France is involved in regulating cross-border interactions. Saudi Arabia would have kind of medium engagements. Um, Saudi Arabia would be very much into trade agreements, but it would be less integrated into things like human rights institutions. And North Korea has practically non-existent engagement with net international networks. Returning to what we spoke about a few weeks ago with soft power, France integrates itself into these networks to influence the global agenda and resolve transnational problems that affect France, like climate change. So the Paris Climate Accord was part of that, even if it sacrifices some of France's sovereignty. What's important, though, is France does not always agree to join international agreements. There was a trade agreement being negotiated with the US between the EU and um, uh, the Obama administration, but ultimately France decided not to join, and the and this meant the EU didn't join this trade agreements. Okay. <clears throat>